Hello. Hello, Schraders. Hello, Halversons. Yo, how are you guys? Hi, Maria. How's everything going? Hi, Melissa. I'm just sharing the links to all of this on our other pages to make it easy for people to find. So you all talk amongst yourselves. Hi, Carol. Just helping some people find us. Hi, Judy. Is Anne with you? Glad to have you here, Carol. We'll start in a few minutes. I'm just giving people some time to get online and helping some people find their way. Hi, Anne. Good to have you here. Sorry I missed your comments last week. I saw them after. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So for those of you that are getting warmed up and sitting and waiting for us to start, which we will in a few minutes, if you do have your Bibles with you and you wanted to read along, which I'll talk about, we're going to be going, picking up right where we left off last week. So we're going to go with uh, John chapter 18, the Gospel of John chapter 18. Hi, Greg Lupion. We will start. Sorry, helping some people find us. Everyone, please just bear with us and we will get started momentarily. Hi, Nancy. Okay, we'll get started in a few minutes. So how is everybody doing? Let's start there. Everybody chime in if you're able to comment, if you're good with that technology, chime in and, and how is everyone doing in a few words? Or let's do one word. Give me one word to sum up how you're doing. Hi, Greg. Hi, Dave. We're going to get started in a few. 
Better. That's good. Better is always good. Glad to hear that, Melissa. Glad to hear you're doing well, Carol. I'm going to start in just a minute. Fair. Okay, that's a fair answer. No pun intended. Hopefully, by the time we're done with Bible study, we'll go from better and fair to really good. We're going to get started soon. John chapter 18. John 18. Does anybody have any questions before I start? Not that we're going to jump right on the gospel. I have some other things we'll talk about. Fair, tough getting through the evenings. This helps. Oh, Maria, okay. Okay. I'm sorry that the evenings are tougher. Uh, Nancy, yes, you can. These live streamings, whether it's the Bible study or Pastor Burlington's worship services, they're live, but then they're there on the church page to watch at any time. So yes, you can. And if you have questions after the fact, when you do watch it, you know where to reach me. I'm happy to help. Okay, we're going to get started. Um, people will jump in where they, where they jump in. Um, welcome. Welcome to our Bible study. Mark Gaffney just got in here. Hi, Mark. Welcome. We're just getting started. I was giving a few moments for people to hop on. So perfect timing. We're happy to have the Gaffneys here. and All the best to your wife. Um, okay, welcome to the Bible study of the Babylon United Methodist Church. I hope everybody is doing well. I know that these are unique circumstances that we find ourselves in, but that's what we're here for, to make life a little easier and to tend to our hearts, minds, and souls through fellowship, even if it's digital. I want to remind us all that this is a safe place the comment board is a safe place, and it is a place that unkindness will not be tolerated. Not that I'm expecting any of that from anybody, but if there are people out there that are watching, a note to everyone, only kindness, only open-mindedness, only welcoming love. If you are viewing this, and I don't see your comments, if you're viewing this in someone's viewing party, maybe somebody shared the link on Facebook and they've created a viewing party, I know Susie Downing did that last week. If you're in a viewing party, that means that I can't see your comments. So, Anne, that was part of why I didn't see your comments last week. Um, so if you are in a viewing party, I'm going to recommend that you maybe leave the viewing party and go into the Facebook page, United Methodist Church of Babylon. I posted links on my page, on our members group page, on our MYF page. So... Try to find us if you can. And if not, just listen and hang out and have fun. I want to apologize up front if you hear my cats or the dog or the family who are inside eating dinner. It's life. It might get a little noisy, um, but we'll just do our best. So here's how this works. Um, we'll read. I'll read and we'll chat. It's uh, If you have a Bible, you're more than welcome to sit and read along. If you want to just listen as I read, you're more than welcome to do that. If I'm reading and my translation is different from yours, which there's a really good chance it will be because there are so many translations and all are valuable in their own way. But if, as I'm reading, you're getting thrown off, my advice and instruction is to stop looking at your Bible and just listen. I don't want you distracted by not being able to follow my translation and your translation at the same time. So that's where we are. Let's talk about what we're doing. Um, we are in the Gospel of John. We are on chapter 18. I am not going to give us a whole lengthy background on the Gospel because it is so deep, so beautiful, so complex. It exists on so many levels, and we'll explore some of those levels tonight but I don't want to overwhelm us either, so we'll just find our fruit there. I did mention this last week. There are 21 total chapters in John's Gospel. The first 11 chapters, so roughly half of the Gospel, focuses on Jesus' three-year ministry. And then the second half of the Gospel, chapters 12 through 21, roughly half of the Gospel, 
focuses it on the last week of his life. So this author devotes half of the gospel to Holy Week. And as I mentioned last week, chapters 12 through 17, we finished 17 last week, five chapters are devoted to Holy Thursday, what we know as the Last Supper, Maundy Thursday. The Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, give it a paragraph. This gospel came a few decades later, so the author did expand on what already existed. So where we're picking up tonight, chapter 18, the supper has ended. Everything's over. Now everything picks up. The story moves forward in the action of late Holy Thursday into Good Friday. Things that will sound very familiar to some of us. So that's where we are. Now before we start, um, I want to give a little bit of uh, extra credit for your soul. Google Christian artwork. For a long time, Western art was predominantly Christian art. No other art was really being made because the church controlled Western civilization, particularly after the Protestant Reformation. Most art, if not all of it, was Christian. And most of that Christian art, aside from Jesus' birth story and the Nativity, most of it's depicting Holy Week events. It's a beautiful rarity when we find artwork that depicts moments in Jesus's three-year ministry. It does exist. It exists in prominence and beautifully, but most Christian art are the Holy Week events, much of which we are clearly going to be reading tonight. So Google it. Look at some Christian art. It's beautiful, and maybe I'll share some depending on how our dialogue goes tonight. So there is a lot of art, and it brings these stories to life in such a, a beautiful and spiritual way. So that's some uh, extra credit for your soul, in case I forget to mention. Okay, that being done, that being said, everyone, I want you all to take a nice deep breath. Take a nice deep breath, close your eyes, and just breathe. Decompress, do your best. Focus on your breathing and clear everything from your mind. And then we'll pray to set us up and start us off. So just take a moment and breathe. Gracious and loving God, we are about to journey into scripture and we ask you to please take us by the hand, open our hearts, open our minds, Lead us with your Holy Spirit. We are yours. We are yours in these turbulent times as much as we are yours in our joyful and peaceful moments. But tonight we are yours and we sit at the footsteps of the Master. We sit at the feet of the Master. Please lead us and guide us in our thoughts and our questions. Help us to hear your voice above all. Jesus, we are yours and we are yours. Amen. Okay, so let's get into it. Here's how this is going to work. It's going to work a little differently than last week. Last week was special. It was the great prayer of Jesus. So rather than read that paragraph by paragraph, I read it as a prayer for his disciples and a prayer for you, for us. Tonight, we're going, we're going back to good old-fashioned conventional Bible study. I'm going to read. You will listen. I'll talk about it a little bit, maybe, and hopefully we'll see some questions and whatnot. So hopefully everyone is on the Gospel of John, chapter 18, excuse me. That's where we're going to start. So let's kick it off. Chapter 18. When he had said this, Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Whom are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. 
Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he again asked them, Who are you looking for? They said, Jesus, the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said, I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guards seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Okay, ends at verse 11, so I'm going to stop there. So, thoughts, comments, questions, reactions? What questions do you have? What struck you? What do you want to talk about? Um, I just got a text message, Susan, from our Bible study. This is a live stream. Nobody can, um, I can't hear or see anybody. This is just me. It's like watching me on television. I'm a television star, so to speak. Um, so, Susan, if you're there and you do have a question or a comment, you can r type the comment in on, on the thing. And that's for anyone that's listening. So, and hi, Katie Rooney. Um, yes, Melissa, three I am statements. Let's talk about that a little bit, especially for those who are new to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John exists on many levels and has many themes and many prominent things about it, one of which is Jesus' I am statements. Last week, uh, or the, sorry, the chapter before last week, Jesus completed his I am statements. There's seven, seven, seven I am statements and seven signs, what we might call miracles, but seven signs. And these I am statements, I am the good shepherd, I am the light of the world, I am the gatekeeper, I am the way, the truth, and the life. All of these point to who he is, letting us know his identity. And those signs point to who he is. They're evidence. This gospel is one big trial. Everything is testimony and witnessing. And people hear who Jesus is see who Jesus is, and then they have to make a choice. So, as Melissa points out, there are three moments where he says, I am. They're not I am statements, because he's made those seven profound I am statements. Why I am? Why is that so important? It harkens back to the Old Testament. It, Hebrew for I am is Yahweh. Yahweh is the name of God. It is that ineffable name, the name that cannot be spoken. It is what God says to Moses, I am. And from there on out, you can't utter that phrase. So when Jesus is saying, I am the good shepherd, he's giving the title the good shepherd, but he's prefacing with that godly identity. So it's tying together. Now in this moment, it clearly goes back to that Yahweh, that I am, I am. And it's three times. John's gospel there's a lot of numbers going on, and they all mean something. So the fact that he says it three times is not by mistake. Um, and also take note. Take note of what happens. We are so ingrained in our Christian minds of what happens in the arrest and all that, that sometimes there are things that we don't realize happened. Because let me just point out what I'm talking about. This one always seems to surprise people. Dave, I'll get to your question in a moment. But look at the reaction um, in verse 6. When Jesus said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. That's how powerful the voice, the word, the name of God is. That's what the author is trying to convey. Dave, there's no specific reason why it's right as opposed to left. Um the people that attend our Bible study, Melissa, Irene in particular, well, they, I've, I've got them so conditioned and trained that they're... Oops, sorry, I had a little connection issue. 
I hope I'm all, I hope I'm still here. Um, but why right over left? No, no specific reason why. Uh, Maria writes, there is comfort in Jesus is saying, I have not lost any of the ones you gave me. And Melissa, I'm struggling to see the rest of the statement. Oh, there it is. Um, Melissa writes, there's comfort in Jesus is saying, I have not lost any of the ones you gave me. Even in his persecution, he is worrying about his disciples. Amen. And absolutely. And if you notice, it says, and I can't seem to find it, that it refers to the fact that he mentioned that. And he mentions it in his great prayer previously, in verse 12 of chapter 17 praying to God and saying, when I was with them, I protected them in your name that you gave me. I guarded them and none of them were lost except Judas, so to speak. And he's mentioned it two other times. So three times in this gospel, he's mentioned, I did not lose and I will not lose any of them. And now here he's saying it again. Um, what other thoughts, comments, questions, reactions do you have? There's a lot going on here. There's a lot to unpack. Any other thoughts? And I want to welcome anyone else that's popped in here. There's a few other things that are going on. I do have a question. Where is this taking place? Can anyone tell me where this is taking place? I'm giving you a moment to type if you are typing. Well, I want to point something out that's going to become pretty important going forward. Yes, Melissa, the garden. The garden. Now, Melissa, I'm glad that you answered with what's there. A lot of times when we do this, when we read our Bible, when we study it, we have, clearly many of us have, previous knowledge. Um, no, Dave, this isn't in the temple. This is outside the temple. Um, away from the temple, it's, it's in the garden. Yes, Maria, in the garden. The name of the garden, as we get from, um, I think, two of the other Gospels, Matthew and Luke, is Gethsemane, the Garden of Gethsemane. But this author goes to lengths to not mention the name of the garden, which is a little odd when you consider... Hi, Sam Watmo! Um, not naming the name of the garden is a little weird when you consider that a lot of what we're seeing in here is detail that is most likely... Hi, Lori. Welcome. Um, there's a lot of eyewitness detail. The lanterns, the torches, the name of the slave who had the ear cut off. Who was there in terms of Romans and, 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 and the temple guards and all of them, but doesn't mention the name of the garden. Those of you especially that have been with us... Any guesses? Melissa, I'm going to ask you directly. Any guess as to why it just says the garden? Let me take a drink of water. Hi, Irene. Welcome. The garden. Just the garden. Okay. I'm going to get to it in a moment. But very briefly, um, as I mentioned, this gospel exists on many levels. This author is telling a narrative story, and then beneath it are multiple symbolic stories. The garden. I keep saying that phrase over and over again. The garden, the garden. Is it making anyone think of anything else? The garden, the garden. All right, I'm going to answer it. This gospel is very much the first part in Jesus' ministry. Jesus was constantly replacing the pillars of Judaism, whether it's the Feast of Dedication, whether it's the Temple, whether it's purification, whether it's the Sabbath, over and over, he is improving, he is improving, he is improving and replacing. One of the other things it is, is it's a replacement and a renewed creation story. Renewed creation story. I didn't hammer that home too much in the first 11 chapters for our Bible study group, but from here on out, we're going to see it over and over again. And yes, um, David, Melissa, and Maria, you all get a gold star. It is about Eden. This is one of the first moments we're going to start to see renewed the, the crucifixion, the resurrection. Bottom line is humanity hasn't done well since creation started. Jesus comes to sort of help us do better and to make things better and to renew 
creation so things are better. So, that's one thing. What else do we have here? What other thoughts, questions, insights do you have? What else struck you? Because I could talk about this passage all day, but I want to see if there are things that you have. Anything else? What do you make of Peter? What do you make of Peter in this? Sorry, we have a dog barking. How do you feel about Peter here? Verse 10, Then Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest, high priest slave, and cut off his right ear. How do you feel about that? What are your thoughts, questions? We're going to focus on Peter a lot in this. Peter aside from Paul and Jesus, of course, is the most prominent person in the New Testament, the most mentioned person in the New Testament. And I want you to make mental note of Peter's act here. Um, Peter is pissed. Peter is lovely. Peter is amazing. Peter is, aside from Paul, Peter and Paul are paired together because they are the two pillars of Christianity after Jesus. Yes, why does he go for the slave and not the guards? And Maria, that sort of hits it on the head. Peter is emotional and reactive throughout Jesus' three-year ministry. He's the hot-headed. He, tell me if you, some of you can relate to this. He is the act first, think after. He's impulsive, impulsive, impulsive. So he loves, loves, loves Jesus passionately. He's the fiery Italian, even though he's not Italian. And why does he go for the slave and not one of the guards? Well, I think we're going to see a little later that Peter's passionate and, and impulsive and brave wanting to defend his friend, but there is a limit to Peter's courage, and we're going to see that in a little bit. So bear that in mind. Um, anything else before we move on? Any other thoughts, comments, questions? So let me ask you a question. Um, who's in control of the situation here based on what you have seen? Who is in control? Is it Judas, who clearly was betraying Jesus by bringing the temple guards and the Romans? Is it the Jewish people, the Jewish officials, Caiaphas and his father-in-law, Annas? Is it the Romans, who are the ruling power? As Maria said, it's, I'm sorry, not Maria, Melissa, it's Jesus. It's Jesus is in full control. Jesus is in full control. If you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as we get closer to the crucifixion in Jesus' ministry, Jesus gets, especially in Mark, my friends, if you are going through a hard time, go read Mark. Jesus is the suffering servant in Mark, the put-upon suffering servant. That's not the case in John. In John's gospel, it's not about suffering. The crucifixion is not about suffering. The arrest and crucifixion are not done to Jesus. Jesus allows it. This is his glory. And as Greg Lupion mentioned, Greg, you mentioned verse 11. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? If you read the synoptics, it's the cup of suffering. In this one, it's just the cup because it's about the glory. And Jesus is in control of every moment. He is in power. He is talking to them. He is saying, I am. He isn't defending himself. He is in full control. He is allowing this to happen. It's like an adult, a mother or father that's play wrestling with their child and letting them win. He's letting them win because this is in his control. Any other thoughts, comments, questions before I move on? Is everyone good so far? Now, I want to make one other point that was made to me by the beautiful and wonderful Max Lucado, who I follow on Instagram. If you've never read Max Lucado or listened to him, he's amazing. Susan Dorn, one of our church friends, gave me a devotional several years ago. It's still my favorite devotional. He's amazing. Anyway, I was watching a mini message of his on Instagram, and he talked about this story. And it doesn't say it here. So I'm going to bring it to this. The other Gospels point out how when this happens, all of the other disciples scatter. They scatter. They run away. And this one doesn't do that. It doesn't mention it. But 
The way Max Lucado tied it to what we're all going through now was beautiful. It's the way only a beautiful mind can really think. And it really resonated with me that we are all scattered right now. But as Max Lucado points out, and as I'll point out who's in control, Jesus, it's okay. Reverend Lang introduced me to Max Lucado, and I'm not surprised. Somebody as wise and as close to God as Max Lucado. I'm sorry, I'm moving Gene. He's trying to knock things off the nightstand. I love you. We're busy. Um, so, the disciples are scattered. They are scattered. And one other thing that doesn't happen in this gospel, talking about Peter, if you read Luke's gospel, there's a, there's a heartfelt, beautiful, sad moment where when they're taking Jesus away, him and... Oh, I'll talk about that in a moment. I'm sorry. That happens later. All right. So, I'm going to move on. Unless anybody wants to stop me, I'm going to move on. Gene, no. I'm busy. All right, I'm going to move on. Gene might go in front of the screen. All right, let's move on. We're picking up at verse 15 for those of you who are coming to us late. Verse 15, chapter 18, verse 15, John's Gospel. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid, who was the gatekeeper, said to Peter, You are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made because it was cold and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there, keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in a synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather, and in secret I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me what I, ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards, guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there keeping warm. And they said to him, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And immediately the cock crowed. Okay, I'm going to stop there, take a sip of water. Thoughts, comments, questions, reactions? What struck you? What do you want to talk about? What would you like to talk about? What questions? What do you got? I have a lot, but I would prefer to let you guide the conversation and where we're going. What do you make of it all? He is scared, meaning Peter, I'm assuming. Not Jesus. Peter is scared. Yeah, yeah, Peter's scared. So, as we mentioned, brave, courageous Peter taking a sword and attacking a slave who probably isn't armed is now scared. Now he's scared. And I'd like to note, again, the details in this gospel are always really, there's really a lot of details. It's not broad, which... We want to say there's, um, there's eyewitness detail, and I'll get to that in a moment. Let me quickly answer Judy's question. Is there a distinction between Peter and Simon Peter? Yes. In first century Palestine, for the Jewish people, they, this area was conquered by the Roman Empire, so the Romans were their conquerors. And what would happen is the Jewish people this time went by two names. You had your Hebrew name, Simon, that your friends, family, relatives, close ones referred to you as. 
And then you had your Greco-Roman, your Greek name, your Latin name, that the rest of the world. So it was like your formal name and your nickname. So Simon is his Hebrew name. Peter, meaning Petra, the rock, was the more everyday name that society would call him. So that's the distinction between the two. That's why you have Paul and Saul. Um, it's very common. Um, so yes, Peter is scared, but remember the question that was asked earlier, why attack a slave and not a soldier? And I didn't want to knock Peter down a peg, but it's hard not to do. And I do it with love because the author does it with love. Look at who Peter is scared of. Did we all notice what made brave, bold, I'm going to swing a sword, Peter get scared? Does everybody notice who initially scares him? And this is the eyewitness detail. Let's go back there. Uh, Maria. I always wondered about the other disciple that gets Peter in the courtyard. Could it have been Nicodemus? Maria, that is one of the big ones, and we'll get there. I, I'm excited to talk about it. Excited to talk about that. Um, but yes, take a look. Verse 17. Then the maid, the maid, who was the gatekeeper, said to Peter. That's who initially scares Peter, the maid. Um, and yes, Melissa, spot on, spot on, spot on. For the remainder of what we read and what we focus on in this chapter, how Jesus is, how everyone else is. How Jesus responds in a crisis, how Peter responds in a crisis. How Peter, how Jesus does things, how the high priest, the officials do things. So yes, it's not coincidental that it's, that Peter's denial in this gospel by this author is framed with the phrase, I am not. That's why I tried very hard to put emphasis on the I am. I am not. So it's, it's compassed and contrary. Now, for one, it is. Jesus is the model, and you compare him to everyone else, particularly in this story. The other thing is, only Jesus could do this, what's being done right now. Peter couldn't walk this path. The other disciple couldn't walk this path. Mary Magdalene couldn't walk this path. This is Jesus' and Jesus' path to walk alone. Only he can do what's going to be done and what's currently being done. So we are comparing, you know, each, but we're also remembering that there's only one Jesus in this story and in the story of life. So, um, okay. As I mentioned before, a lot of themes that take place in this gospel. There are so many themes. I could go on and on, and as our Thursday evening regulars will tell you, I do go on and on. As we move forward through these events on to the end, it will be a renewed creation theme, but also a huge theme of this gospel is the other disciple. The other disciple. Also known, was introduced in Jesus' Last Supper dialogues in the previous five chapters, known as the Beloved Disciple, the Beloved Disciple, here being mentioned as the Other Disciple. There are three prominent theories as to who the Other or the Beloved Disciple is. One of those theories, Maria, is, yes, that it could have been a Pharisee, perhaps Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea. That's how that person would know Caiaphas and the high priest and everyone because they sat on the Sanhedrin, the Jewish high council together. Another one is that it could have been a woman, um, just an unnamed woman, maybe Mary Magdalene or Mary or Martha, not Mary's mother. The other prominent and best theory is that it is um, the disciple John, not John the Baptist, the disciple John, the youngest of Jesus' disciples, the one who wrote Revelations, the one who wrote the two epistles, First and Second John. Um, yes, thank you, Laurie, for saying yes, I do go on. Awesome. <laughs> I miss you, Laurie. Part of why it connects that John or this other disciple would know the high priest, James and John, two brothers, two of Jesus' disciples, they were fishermen. Their father owned a fishing business. And there is archaeological evidence that scholars point to that we are almost positive that they sold fish to the high priest, that their fishing business was in business with the high priest. Nothing wrong with that. So that would be how they know. 
the how the other disciple knows the household, the staff, all of it. And notice again with the staff, the maid who is the gatekeeper. And previously before that, um, the acquaintance of the high priest who went out and spoke to the gatekeeper. Yes, eyewitness detail, but also I am the gate was one of Jesus' statements. So a lot of this gospel, what happens here towards the end, goes back to the beginning. It's all cyclical, symbiotic. It all goes around. So all right, yes, as Laurie would tell you, I'm going on and on and on. I do not want to um, dominate, even though I can't hear you people. But what else? What else struck you? What else is there? What other comments, thoughts, questions do you have? And Maria, I'm glad that makes sense. Um, but I am not saying right now that the beloved disciple or the other disciple is John. Stick with us through the end. We'll talk about that in more detail. So, what else? What else struck you? What else is in here? Oh, no spoilers, but I want you to make note. Again, eyewitness detail, but look at verse 18. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire. Again, a lot of eyewitness detail, but nothing in this gospel is by accident. If you want to know what that means, it'll come to fruition later. So you're welcome to read ahead. That's always good. But stick with us and you'll find out why that's there in this moment. What else? What else do you have? A lot going on here. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? Yes, Melissa, 100%. Verse 23, testified. This is all the continuing trial. That's why we don't see the full trial before the Sanhedrin, because this whole gospel has been a trial. Why mention the fire? Is there symbolism there? You read my mind. Well, in John's gospel, there is always contrasts of light and dark. Jesus, I'm sorry, think about that. Who is the light of the world? Jesus. Where is Peter? Not near Jesus. Even though he was trying to follow him, follow me, he's near the people and a fire. So he's near that light, not near the light. So that's one thing. But there is significance as to why a charcoal fire and why Peter's failure happens here. We'll see later. Um, is there any significance that the gatekeeper was a woman? I wish there was, because in John's Gospel, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, John's treatment of women is phenomenal. Women are the superheroes of this story, just like Luke's Gospel, same thing. Um, but no, no significance that it was a woman. You know, no, short answer. Um, he is now in the darkness. Yeah, he is. He's not fully in the darkness because he is near light, but... He's trying to follow Jesus, but he's not doing it properly because that's all of the disciples' MO, particularly Peter. And it's also because they don't have all the information just yet because the crucifixion, the resurrection hasn't happened yet. So the story is incomplete. So their tutelage is not complete just yet. But yeah, Peter does fail. He does fail here. Um, but he tried. Again, I want to emphasize that he tried. He went to his friend. He he was he was there where everyone else ran away. Everyone else was gone. But Peter at least was there. Um, what else? What else do you have? If you read Mark's gospel, a technique that is used in Mark's gospel known as the Mark and Sandwich, Mark and for Mark, sandwich for, you know, sandwich, meat and two breads on the side. That's what this passage does. Um, and Dave, I'll get to your question in a second because we're focusing on Peter. It started with Peter, then it went to being Jesus with Annas, the high priest's father-in-law, and then back to Peter. So it's Peter, Annas, Peter. It, 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 it's Peter uh, you know, emphasizing what's going on with Annas. So I don't want us to miss that middle sandwich part. Um, so are the questioning their faith? Dave, I'm sorry, can, can we get a retype on that? So are they questioning their faith? Is who questioning their faith? Give me, give me a little bit more for that question so I can answer it a little bit better. Um, while Dave is doing that, any other thoughts, comments, questions about Peter, about what happens in the beginning, what happens at the end, and what happens in the middle there with, with Annas and Jesus? Because we haven't even talked about this moment with Jesus being questioned. 
thoughts, comments, questions. Now, I want to take a moment to point out that this is a kangaroo court. And I don't mean that flippantly or figuratively. Literally, it is. If you read the rules of the Sanhedrin, read the rules in the Talmud, there is a list of rules that are designed to protect the accused. There's so many things that can't be done or, sh or not allowed to be done, and they're violating all of them. Questioning him at night, asking him to present witnesses, asking him questions that can incriminate himself. All of it, all of it is a sham. It's, as has been put, it's a lynching is what it is. Um, Peter, he was the outside guy. Does he feel scared? Yes, he does. Peter does feel scared. Peter was brave to go, but the bravery only goes so far, and I don't say that in a derogatory or judgmental way, but Peter is now in the lion's den. Peter is in the lion's den. He's there. The soldiers are there. Everyone's there. The powerful and beautiful and amazing Jesus has been arrested. Peter's world is thrown upside down. He's terrified. He's terrified of what's going on around him. He at least went there. But yes, he's terrified. And yes, Lori and, P and David, there are questions of faith. This is a moment of Peter's faith being questioned. Because he has seen Jesus do some amazing things. Walking on water. Raising Lazarus from the dead. All of it. Now it's a moment of questioning his faith. Of being scared and afraid. Faith is great when you're hanging out, you know, and everything's beautiful and wonderful. This is the moment when it's hard. But again, for Peter, his tutelage wasn't complete because the story wasn't complete. Everything hinges on the resurrection. Until that moment, Peter and the others, it's fear, it's struggling in faith. Understandable. What else do we have? As Melissa pointed out, yes, testify. Trial theme. Again, survival is very is a very human feeling absolutely judy amen i could not agree more if i was in this situation one would i have followed i don't know two would i have been honest and said i would yeah i'm one of the disciples what do you want to do about it you want to arrest me too i don't know i don't think so i would probably would have been just as scared as peter if not more scared and i think as you said um very human feeling self-preservation Peter, as Maria just says, represents our own humanity. I Every time I talk about Peter in our Bible studies, over and over again, I always say he is the most relatable individual in the New Testament. He is so human. He is so human. And what makes it beautiful, this gospel was written years after Peter's death. They are writing about Peter. You know, he became a titan. He became a giant. And in doing so, he shared with new disciples, new followers, his story. He shared with them this story. He told them, this is how I was. Go read Mark's gospel. Mark makes Peter look horrible. Mark was a disciple of Peter. He was a student of Peter. He got it all from Peter. So Peter's human, very human. Uh, hello, Evelyn. Any other thoughts, comments, questions before we move on? Again, Jesus being questioned, not by the high priest, not by the Sanhedrin, but by Annas. Um, Lori, when I said he was in the lion's den, I was speaking figuratively, not literally, meaning he's right there in, in the dangerous spot. These people have arrested him, and he's going to where they are. He's going into enemy territory, so to speak. They could all very easily... As they're pointing at him and saying, aren't you one of his disciples? Isn't that one of him? Arrest him. Grab him. So he's in danger. That's what I mean. Um, but look, again, look at how Jesus is responding in verses 19 through 24. Haven't I spoken publicly to the world? Haven't I always taught in synagogue or in temple area? I wasn't hiding. Why are you asking me? Ask those who heard me. Now, if you notice in this gospel, they're questioning about what he said, what they heard. Jesus talking about what he said. In John's gospel, in this gospel, Jesus is the word, the word of God. So for this author and for Jesus here, it's all about what Jesus says. Just his words alone are enough. And think about that sentence deep in your soul. 
just as words are, are enough. Um, any other thoughts, comments, questions? Okay. What I was starting to allude to before, before I started up this passage, in Luke's Gospel, after Peter denies Jesus, as Jesus said he would, and Peter said, no, I would never do that. I would never, never, ever, ever do that. And then he does it. Peter's heart breaks. In Luke's Gospel, when they're, after Jesus denies him, and Peter denies him, and Jesus is taken away, there's a moment Luke describes where Peter and Luke make eye contact. It's just crushing. And this is the last time Peter will see Jesus. He doesn't have a moment to see him before the crucifixion to apologize. He won't see him until after, until the, after the resurrection, which is, which is tough, which is hard. Um, so what else? Any other thoughts, comments, questions before we move on? No? Okay, I'm moving on. I'm moving on. Um... All right, so Jesus in full control, full control and being strong, not denying, standing up to the injustice with, with strength, with stoicism. So we are going to pick up at verse 28, 28. So Jesus has been arrested. He went to the high priest's father-in-law's home, Annas. Peter denied him. Okay, denied knowing him. 26, I'm sorry, uh, verse 28. Let me take a drink of water. Bear with me one second. Okay, verse 28. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium. It was morning. And they themselves did not enter the Praetorium in order not to be defiled so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, what charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, would we have not brought him? Sorry. They answered him and said, If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. At this, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, We do not have the right to execute anyone in order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, that he said, indicating the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? And Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, what attendance would my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews? But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king? Jesus answered, You say I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this one, but Barabbas. Now, Debra now, Barabbas was a revolutionary. I'm going to stop there. So, thoughts, comments, questions, reactions? Anything? Anything strike you? Anything interesting? Anyone? What do you got? Do we all understand the narrative and some of the things that are taking place in here? I want to point a few things out if there are no questions, um, just so we're all understanding what's taking place here. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas, who is the Jewish high priest, to the Praetorium, which is the governor, the Roman governor's residence. 
the author lets us know it was morning, and it lets us know that the Jewish officials didn't enter the Praetorium, the governor's home, so that they wouldn't be defiled. They couldn't enter a Gentile's home because then they couldn't eat the Passover meal. Now, before I move on, does any of that strike anyone? Any thoughts, comments, questions? The Praetor, I'm sorry, the, uh, the Passover, we traditionally, from the other Gospels, see the Passover meal as being the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper on Thursday. But this author makes it Friday, the meal. Um, yes, it was morning. And yes, hello, Jen. Um, ooh, all the comments are now coming through. You guys were so quiet a minute ago. Now they're all coming through. So let's see. Let's talk. Let's start with Pontius. That's all right, Dave. I got what you meant. Yeah, Pontius Pilate didn't want to punish him. Pontius Pilate did not. If you read Matthew's gospel, there's even more Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate was impressed by him. Pontius Pilate's wife had a dream about Jesus and told Pontius Pilate, don't have anything to do with this man. Don't, you know, just step away from it. Pontius Pilate was impressed by him. He didn't want to kill him. He didn't want, but Pontius Pilate, his situation wasn't secure. He had had a lot of trouble with the area he was occupying. He had had ruled with a little bit of an iron fist. And bottom line, Rome said, if there's anything else, anything else happens, you're getting taken out of there and it won't be pretty where you're going. So he is someone that is stuck between a rock and a hard place because he knows that if he, if he, well, for one, if he convicts Jesus and sentences him to death, he could have a, um, a rebellion on his hands. If he doesn't, he knows, if he says to the Jewish authorities, no, this man's innocent, let him go free, he'll have a rebellion on his hands. Either way, he's kind of, so, so what do you make of that Pontius Pilate dilemma? How do you feel about that, about his decision? It's a tough one for him. And he is someone that, as, Mar as Melissa points out, where's Melissa's comment? Um, verse 38, I was born to testify to the truth. We'll get to the truth part in a second. But testify, I have said that this whole gospel is one big trial. Jesus presenting evidence, John the Baptist as a witness, Jesus giving his seven I am statements so people know who he is, Jesus doing his seven signs to point to who he is. Why all of that? You are presented with evidence of who Jesus is, his words, his word, his actions, his identity. You are now left to make a decision. You're with him or you're not. You're one of his followers or you're part of the world. Pontius Pilate is the perfect example in this gospel of someone who had to make a decision. He did. He was presented with a decision, and it was innocence or guilt. I dig you or no. And he didn't, he didn't make that decision. Maria, I do agree with you. It wasn't his decision. Jesus is still in control. But the way I always like to, to look at it, we always have a fatalistic approach to the gospel. We often have a fatalistic approach to the gospel. Judas had to betray Jesus. Pontius Pilate had to do what he did so that the plan would play, play out. No, God could have called an audible. There could have been a plan B. Pontius Pilate could have said, this man is amazing. I'm so impressed with him in, in five minutes and he's innocent, clearly. And you guys are up to no good with how you're doing this. I'm setting him free. There could have been a, a plan B, but there wasn't. And as this says, it says that this was done to fulfill the type of death that Jesus said he would have. That is crucifixion, being lifted up. Do I think Jesus was a follower? Uh, do I think Barabbas was a follower of Judas? Uh, sorry, do, do you think Barabbas was a follower of Jesus? He knew he was innocent. No, no, no. Um, I don't think Barabbas was a follower of Jesus, and I don't see here that it says he was innocent. It's Pilate that says he knew he was innocent. Barabbas was a revolutionary, most likely a zealot. Zealots are the ones that were 
insurrectionists against Rome. They were fighting. They were, you know, so Barabbas was, they've said, a murderer, but that's who Barabbas was. He wasn't a follower. He was out for the violent insurrection, not the Jesus peace-loving insurrection. And yes, Pilate is very human. And he does, as Melissa said, he's very human, but he makes the wrong decision. He's a really fascinating character, but he does make the wrong decision, um, at least according to our spiritual um, moral compass. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a tough one. Um, I'm just backtracking to see that there are some other questions I didn't want to miss. So yes, truth, 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 truth. This gospel mentions truth over and over and over again. It mentions it, I think, like 45 times in the gospel, the word true or truth. When Jesus, during the Last Supper in those five chapters, introduces the concept of a Holy Spirit to the disciples, he calls it a spirit of truth. And right here we have Pilate asking, what is truth? And Pilate wants to know. He does want to know. It's, it's one of these things in this gospel. And Jesus is what's true. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's one of his seven I am statements. Pilate asking, what is truth? But not really wanting to know the answer. Because when he's confronted with the answer, it's no. Um, and yet what Jesus was saying was more dangerous to the Jews of the time. Yeah, yeah, it was. Not all the Jews. Not all the Jews and not all the Jews in power. Not all the Pharisees. Not all those that sat on the Sanhedrin. Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, two members of the Jewish council. But to the large swath of Jewish people and to the powers that be, no, no, he was a threat. He was more dangerous because... He was taking away their power. He was taking away their authority. He was taking away their way of life. And doesn't that speak to a lot of power today? Um, speaking truth to power is not an easy thing. And Jesus was the truth. Let's see. What other comments did we have that we can look at? Um, and yes, Maria, I do agree with you. Jesus is still in control. What else do we have? And just to give an idea of why... These particular Jewish leaders were not the best. Take a look at um, 29, verse 29. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? Listen to the snarky answer. They answered and said to him, If you were not a criminal, would we have handed him over to you? Basically saying, We're bringing him to you, so that's all you need. We don't need to give you evidence. Pilate is an idiot. He understands that these men just want him to rubber stamp Jesus's um, execution because as it says Pilate says in 31 take him um, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law Mosaic law and the Jews answered we do not have the right to execute anyone they used to but the Romans took it away because they they didn't do a good job of how they were executing people or why they were executing people so these are not good rulers um, what does Maria say and yet, what Jesus was saying was... Oh, that's the same thing she just said. Okay, sorry. Um, so, I'm going off. I'm looking at it. I have a lot more I can say. Do you have any other thoughts, comments, questions? Anything else? Now, for the symbolism of John's Gospel. If you count it, seven times, G Pilate goes back and forth between Jesus... And the, and the Jewish officials. Seven times there are Pilate questioning. Seven times. Seven times. Seven times. Any other moments that make you think of seven? Anything else? Well, as I mentioned before, this gospel is renewed creation. Jesus renewing creation. So you're going to see the number seven over and over again because according to Genesis... Seven days for creation. Also take a look at some other themes in addition to kingdom. I'm sorry, in addition to truth is kingdom. Um, verse 36, kingdom, kingdom. And then verse 36, kingdom, three times. 37, Pilate, king, king. In this gospel, it is in this chapter, it's mentioned six times. In the next chapter, seven times. Fifteen times between Pilate and Jesus. Kingdom. And yes, Maria, creation. So that's another heavy theme. Um, 
What else? Any other thoughts, comments, questions? Anything else? Now, I want to mention one other thing that I alluded to earlier, and there's a reason I mentioned it. This passage opens with the author letting us know that this that the, the Jewish officials didn't go into the governor's home so that they wouldn't be defiled and thus causing them to miss the Passover meal. And I also mentioned that Thursday, according to the Synoptic Gospels, is was a Passover meal. So let's let me frame this question like this. Most likely the Passover meal was on Thursday, but the author is placing it on Friday for theological and thematic reasons. Any guesses as to why the author wants this day, this moment, this Friday, to be the day of the Passover meal? Any, any guesses why? Any guesses why? Maria, Melissa? Any guesses why? Greg Lupion, are you still with us? Love to hear your thoughts. Any guesses why this day would be the Passover according to the author? Well, one thing, one way that we always look at the crucifixion, amen, that's it, Maria. Jesus was the sacrifice. He was the sacrificial lamb. And... Pilate declared him innocent. He said, this man is innocent. The Passover lamb needed to be, um, how do they put it in Exodus? Un unblemished. The Passover lamb needed to be unblemished, spotless, innocent. Jesus was unblemished, spotless, innocent. He is the Passover lamb. So that is part of why the author... Um, well, no, Carol, I, I might have not um, framed the question properly. Yes, it is on a Friday, but I'm saying why did the author make the Passover meal on this day? So, yeah, yeah, it, it is on a Friday so that the resurrection is on Sunday, three days. But the, this author made the Passover meal on that day because Jesus is the innocent lamb slain. And, yes, he replaced the Passover meal with his body and blood and... A census report that was taken 30 years by Rome after this estimates that on the Passover in Jerusalem, with all of the people coming to Jerusalem for the Passover, there would have been roughly a quarter of a million lambs slaughtered in the temple. And the rivers would have been flowing with blood from the temple coming, from the blood coming out of the temple from the slaughtered lambs. So when we heard before, when we started this chapter, when Jesus said, said this, Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley. He crosses a river that probably would have been red with lamb's blood. And Jesus would have seen that. And that would have been something weighing in his heart and mind as he goes to his crucifixion. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? Anything else you want to look at? Anything else in here that you... You found interesting. So, Jesus still in full control. Jesus amid all of this ugliness. Other people being human, whether it's clinging to their power or not giving justice to people that deserve proper justice, injustices being handed out. There is a lesson that I, I would like us all to take away from this, in this moment. We talked about it earlier when we saw how Jesus was handling himself when he was arrested in the garden. How Jesus was handling himself when he was being questioned by Annas. Now how Jesus is handling himself when he's being questioned by Pilate. Yes, Jesus knows what's going to happen. He, this is his destiny and his doing. He's going willingly. That doesn't mean he wants to. When you read the Synoptic Gospels, he's not looking forward to this. In Matthew and Mark, he says, Father, if, this, if it is at all possible, let this cup pass me. 
pass from me, meaning his cup of suffering, yet not my will, your will be done. And it says that he was sweating blood. That's how stressed he was. He does not want to do this. He is human in this moment, and he will be undergoing some terrible pain. How does he conduct himself? If you were to, to put Jesus' character and how he faces all of this in one word, what's the word that springs to mind for you? How does he handle it in the face of this, this crisis, these jerks, this injustice, this mistreatment, all of it? I mean, I know the word strength, a word that I think is Zen. Jesus is the absolute Zen master in this moment. He really is. And I think that that is a model for us to strive for. Poised. I would agree with that, Melissa. He's very poised. I know that grace, grace, poise, brave, dignity, all of it. All, uh, amen. I agree wholeheartedly. Numb? Dave, numb. You're talking, you're saying that he's numb in this moment. That's interesting. Dave, can you expand on that a little bit? Grace, I would agree with you, Lori. Dave, give me more. Why are you feeling like he's numb in this moment? And the reason why I ask is I, I'm not getting a numb feeling. I'm getting a, a person in full control of their faculties and feeling everything that's going on. Um, faith in God, absolutely. Faith in his Father, as Judy said, 100%. He's proceeding with faith. He's proceeding with grace, with dignity, brave, um, poised. I can tell you, with all Peter-like honesty and humility, I, in my worst times, am not always poised. I, I am not always determined or grace or, you know, strong or brave or, you know, faith can be a struggle. You know, it can be, it can be tough. And I think we all can relate to that. And when we have those moments, maybe what some of us are going through now, courage, Irene, you know more about courage than anyone, that it's not always easy. But then we look to this, the, lo the lowest point, and it's about to get lower. And geez, this is how he's responding. So um, let's hear what Dave has to say. Uh, I feel like he has to do this now and understands why, but he's still not sure why in a way. I feel that way sometimes. Dave, I, I agree. I agree. Um, I agree in a certain way. I do think that Jesus knew why, because when you read this gospel in particular, when... We go back to the opening of this gospel. This gospel, which does not have a nativity story. Nativity is only in, in Luke and in um, Matthew. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning. All things came to be through him, and without him nothing came to be. That's Jesus. Jesus isn't just the human incarnation of God, God made flesh. Jesus is all of God. He is the omniscience, the eminence, there at the beginning, here now, here then. So I am a believer that Jesus did know why and did know what was going to happen and did know what he was doing. And that's why it makes it more of that selfless agape love that he gives of himself knowing one he's innocent knowing he didn't do anything and knowing the need that we as humanity have for that love that comes in that example and that sacrifice and so I am of the mind that he did know but I could be wrong I could be wrong either way we can look at it as a sacrifice I know why it's being done, and that makes it hard. 
So it's a sacrifice I'm doing it, or I don't know why this is being done to me. And that makes it hard, and that's a sacrifice. And the other thing I just want to point out about how Jesus is being in this moment, if you notice, he's looking out for his disciples. I didn't mention it in the opening of this, but he was looking out for his disciples. In this moment of being arrested and giving himself as a sacrificial Passover, Paschal lamb, an innocent lamb, He's doing it for us, to protect us, to be with us, for us. When he's arrested, he's saying, you know, take me, don't, don't harm these people. He's constantly protecting. Zen, brave, courage, dignity, all of it. Um, any other thoughts, comments, questions, insights, anything else that anyone would like to share? Uh, let's see what Lisa has to say. Lisa Landry. Hi, Lisa. He was resigned as to what was to happen. He knew why, but still was not easy for him. I agree. I agree. I think part of what makes Jesus' sacrifice so deep and profound is that he knew what was going to happen, and he knew why, and he proceeded anyway. And he proceeded with grace, with dignity, with courage, with zen, with... All of the wonderful things that we all aspire to in our worst moments and don't always achieve, but we can always try and do better. This is the model. This is the example right here, right here. Um, I'm going to close by reading something to wrap up this chapter, and then we'll say a prayer to close us out. Before I do, though, any other thoughts, comments, questions? Anyone? 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 Okay, I would like to read something um, from a, a Bible scholar, Donald Sr. It's very good. Uh, okay, John's account plunges directly into the action of Jesus' violent nighttime arrest. This opening scene immediately introduces the reader to the tone of paradox that runs throughout John's passion story. That's what we are reading now, the passion story. On one level of the story, we have the ominous rituals of violence and apparent defeat, betrayal by a friend, the threatening presence of armed soldiers, a nighttime arrest of an innocent man, summary interrogation, trial, and torture, finally a public execution and a hasty burial. Sorry, that's a spring ahead a little bit. The genius of John's passion narrative is that these gruesome realities of seeming defeat and death do not dominate the story. Woven in and through the account of Jesus' suffering and death is another mood. Jesus, God's powerful word, is triumphant over death. He is not a victim from whom life is violently taken, but one who gives his life freely as an act of love for the world. He can trace this blend of death and triumph triumph in almost every element of this opening scene. We can trace this blend of death and triumph triumph in almost every element of this opening scene. And I think that is a beautiful synopsis. The good and the triumph, the death and the triumph. That's a balance of what we're going through right now and what we are always going through. It's a balance of hardship and overcoming. So my friends, I pray that you go in peace. I pray that you bring this gospel with you, that you turn to it, that you turn to Jesus, and that you remember the way, the truth, and the life. I love you all. I wish you peace. Have a good night. We'll see you soon.